Today's Washing Tech episode is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at washingtech.com forward slash book. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And also Warby Parker. Get a free five-day home try-on at warbyparkertrial.com forward slash Joe. Five pairs, five days, and the try-on is 100% free. That's warbyparkertrial.com forward slash Joe. We're identifying technical experts who don't already know policy. We're teaching them policy through an in-residence fellowship program in San Francisco this summer. And then we're encouraging them to develop outside the box solutions to society's problems. Welcome to the Washing Tech Tech Policy Podcast. We deliver the latest tech policy news and brightest tech policy experts to you. Wherever you are, so you can stay productive, relevant, and informed in less time. From Washington, D.C., it's the Washing Tech Tech Policy Podcast with Joe Miller. The annual White House Intelligence Report says Russia and China will try and undermine the 2020 election. The FCC struggles in its net neutrality arguments, and Betsy Cooper is my guest today. In his annual threat assessment report, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats told the Senate Intelligence Committee that Russia and China will try to interfere with the 2020 presidential election. The report lists social media threats as second on a list of several threats to U.S. national security. A three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals heard oral arguments from the government and consumer advocates last week on consumer advocates' lawsuit against the FCC for repealing the 2015 open Internet rules. Two of the judges, Patricia Millett and Robert Wilkins, both Obama appointees, seemed to side with the consumer advocates as the FCC struggled to persuade the court that the agency had the authority to reclassify broadband as an information service. BuzzFeed reported that popular home DNA testing company Family Tree DNA is working with the FBI, allowing agents to access its database to investigate violent crimes. Privacy advocates object to the partnership, but others say that as more people sign up for genetic tests, the data has become increasingly valuable to solve cold cases, with the arrest last year of the suspected Golden State Killer being a prime example. The feds have charged a second Apple engineer with stealing company trade secrets with a plan to bring them back to China. Another Apple employee spotted Xi Zhang Chen taking snapshots of his workspace with a wide-angle lens, even though he was working under an NDA. Apparently, Chen had some 2,000 files on his hard drive, including manuals and schematics. He says he was going to China to see family, but the feds allege he was actually planning to bring the files back to a uh, Chinese car manufacturer he helped uh, he had applied for a job with it's the second apple employee charged with stealing trade secrets from the company's self-driving car unit apple reported a bug with group facetime that allowed callers to hear the people they were calling before they answered. The company took down group FaceTime when it learned of the bug, apologized and announced that it would release a fix for the problem this week. The information reports that Facebook has hired three leading privacy critics from Access Now, EFF, and OTI as the company tries to deal with the onslaught of backlash around its privacy woes. Robin Green, Nathan White, and Nate Cardozo have been critical of Facebook and all joined the company within the last month. No word yet on whether Facebook will be hiring privacy critics from civil rights organizations. Finally, T-Mobile and Sprint have tapped former FCC chair and commissioner Mignon Clyburn to help advise them on their $26 billion merger. Clyburn said in a statement that she will be advising the two companies as a continuation of her work to ensure vulnerable populations have affordable access to 5G. You can find links to all these stories in the show notes and also in our Twitter feed. And our handle is at WashingTech. Stay with us. Washington Tech Tech Policy Podcast listeners, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. You can listen at the gym, in the car, or on your morning run. How about Deep Work by Cal Newport? You can download Deep Work free by trying audible.com. Sign up for your free audiobook and 30-day trial today at washingtech.com forward slash book. Washington, the inclusive voice of tech policy. 
Because America won't stand still for the same old insiders. 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 Washington. Moving the needle. My guest today is Betsy Cooper. Betsy's the founding director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub and a senior advisor at Albright Stonebridge. A cybersecurity expert, Betsy joined Aspen after directing the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Previously, she was an attorney advisor at DHS, and she's also been a cybersecurity consultant in the UK and at the World Bank. Betsy clerked for Judge William Fletcher on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford and a Yale Public Interest Fellowship. Betsy earned her JD from Yale, a doctoral degree in philosophy and master's in forced migration from Oxford, and her BA in industrial and labor relations from Cornell. Betsy Cooper. Betsy, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Joe. It's good to be here. Tell us a bit about the Aspen Institute's Tech Policy Hub. What does it mean to build a tech policy incubator? So we're essentially modeling ourselves after tech startup incubators like Y Combinator or 500 Startups. But we're training new policy thinkers and focusing the impact of their ideas rather than helping them build startups. So at the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, we're identifying technical experts who don't already know policy. We're teaching them policy through an in-residence fellowship program in San Francisco this summer. And then we're encouraging them to develop outside-the-box solutions to society's problems. At the end of the program, they'll have the opportunity to exit by presenting their ideas not to funders, but to actual policy decision makers that can make an impact in the space. And so in terms of the, t- the policy issues that they're going to be working on, what are sort of three key policy issues that you believe are sort of most important to tech policy and how do they rank in importance? So we have four priority areas, so I'll touch on each of them briefly. Uh, first is cybersecurity. So we're interested in the intersection between security and technologies on the Internet and how we can improve our digital security. Second is the impact of new technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning or the Internet of Things. Third is uh, democracy, uh, protecting democracy, uh, preventing misinformation, disinformation, and uh, ensuring election security. So we're really interested in how do we maintain a strong democratic system within technology. And finally is using technology to help, uh, you know, sort of individuals that might be at risk or uh, using it uh, in terms of social justice. So we want people who can build new things and uh, try to use them in a positive way to improve our society. All four of these areas are incredibly important to tech policy, and it would be very hard to rank them in importance, not least because they all intersect at that sort of core area of how technology is affecting our lives. And so we hope to see proposals on all of those areas. And so turning to cybersecurity, because it's a huge topic right now, um, you know, I don't want to sound fatalistic here, but it almost seems as if it's sort of too late to ramp up the workforce and fill those critical cybersecurity jobs, you know, that are sitting open both with the federal government and in the private sector. What are your thoughts on this? So I don't think it's too late to fill the jobs, but it's definitely a difficult challenge. Um, And one of the key challenges in the cybersecurity workforce space is that it's hard to train people for the present, but it's even harder to keep them prepared for the future. So if we put people into academic programs today and teach them what we think the key issues of cybersecurity will be right now, even five years from now, that's likely to change dramatically. And thinking 10, 20, 30 years down the road, it's hard to keep people trained. Um, So I think we need creativity in the way that we're building the cybersecurity workforce. We need ongoing education for those that are already involved And we need to really do our due diligence to figure out how new technologies such as artificial intelligence will affect what cybersecurity looks like down the road so that we can have a dynamic workforce that stays ahead of these issues rather than a static one uh, that has to be continually replaced. So this Tech Policy Fellowship is interesting. Tell us a little bit about how it's going to work. First and foremost, uh, individuals are applying uh, to the program. So we're actually open for applications now through February 27th. And we're looking for people who have some form of technical expertise. So they could be founders or staffers at big companies. They could be think tankers. They could be faculty, students, uh, patent lawyers, journalists. Um, They're all welcome to apply if they have strong technical expertise. They know about technology. And on the other hand, we're not looking for people 
who have tons of prior policy experience. In fact, we prefer people who are new to policy because they don't have preconceived notions of how policy should be built. So we're going to accept a number of folks into this inaugural version of the program, and we're going to teach them policy through the in-person fellowship program in the Bay Area. So we're going to give them lots of coursework. We're going to give them resources such as communication, training, and design help. We're really going to give them the tools like any other incubator to help make them successful. And we're going to encourage them to work in teams to develop new and innovative ideas for solving problems. So we're looking for risky ideas. We're looking for them to flip the usual way of doing policy and to be more creative and to build things uh, together using their complementary skill sets, so not just working on their own. The fellows will exit our program by presenting their work to real decision makers. And so we really hope to grow an alumni base of folks that understand the importance of successfully mixing tech and policy no matter what job they move on to. Well, Betsy, thanks for joining us. Now let's shift gears to your icebreaker, your career advice, and your pick for our book this week. Okay, so it's time for this week's icebreaker. Ready? Yep. All right, where is the last place you went for the first time? Well, my husband and I finally took our honeymoon only three years late. And so we went to New Zealand. Um, Some of the highlights were seeing a lot of the Marlboro wine region, uh, visiting a Merino sheep farm and having some really delicious food uh, in Auckland. So it was a pretty awesome experience. Yeah, I was in China for the first time last year. I went to uh, Beijing and Shanghai to see JD.com's headquarters. Be uh, really interesting to see how they grow without all of these uh, trade regu- these unnecessary trade barriers. So, but how do you work, uh, Betsy? What are some of the work habits that you think are, are critical to be successful? Well, I definitely prioritize efficiency, uh, especially uh, during this recruitment period where there's an awful lot going on. Um, I work from home a lot uh, because I find that when I procrastinate, I procrastinate by doing housework and the laundry rather than just checking Facebook and Twitter all day. Um, I really try to concentrate phone calls and meetings in, you know, certain periods of the day so I have time to get actual work done. Um, and I'm willing to get up early or work a little late in order to help make sure that everything gets done. When you're working on a small team like I am, you really have to be a jack of all trades. And I definitely uh, am finding myself spending a lot of time uh, trying to build this program and make it successful. What are you reading and watching these days? Oh, so I'm actually reading an interesting book. Um, I'm reading Ayn Rand's We the Living, which I haven't read probably since it was assigned to me in high school. Uh, but it's a book about her perspectives on dictatorship. And since um, she's often used, Ayn Rand, especially by conservatives, as suggesting a way forward for our society, um, it's really interesting to see how she's reflecting on some of the more nefarious you know, trends of our time in terms of moving towards dictatorship and you know, sort of thinking about how she would be reflecting on some of those trends if she were still alive. And of course, I always have a romance novel on the go. So when that gets a little heavy, I switch over to that. I've been reading Cal Newport's Deep Work to get a better handle on my performance and productivity. So much of what I do is content-based, and I'm sure you, you as well. I mean, everything is content. So I'm always trying to look for methodologies and processes to kind of churn out more content that's more thoughtful and less time. It's a constant challenge for sure. Well, thanks again, Betsy, for joining me. What are some takeaways you'd like to leave with us and where can we find you online? Well, so the most important thing, my call to action is really to get the word out about the fellowship and to get people applying. As I mentioned, we really want a diverse set of people who have lots of different types of expertise in technology. And so we really encourage anybody who listens to the podcast, you're probably somebody who should be uh, thinking about applying to the fellowship. And I forgot to mention, but we pay you. Uh, you get 7500 a month for joining us. So uh, so it should be an opportunity that everybody uh, thinks about taking up. Um, so please help us get the word out. You can find me at Bets on Tech on Twitter and at the AspenTechPolicyHub.org. And you've been listening to Betsy Cooper, Director of the Aspen Tech Policy Hub and Senior Advisor at the Albright Stonebridge Group. Betsy, thanks for joining me. It was a pleasure, Joe. Thank you so much. <laughs> 